what makes life meaningful. And presenting the topic is uh, Dr. King, Laura King. She's a distinguished professor of uh, psychological sciences at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Did her bachelor's degree, degree in English literature and psychology at Kenyon College. Her doctorate degree is in personality psychology from University of California, Davis. She has published uh, immensely over 100 articles and chapters and uh, authored two books. So without any further delay, I welcome Dr. King. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I am, I'm Laura King. Um, I think that the best, um, the best way for us to uh, communicate today is if you forget everything you think you know about psychology and what it is that makes life meaningful. I also want to uh, apologize up front for my terrible sounding voice. I got sick yesterday. Um, and this means there will be no hugs. As much as you'll want to hug me, I will not hug you today. <laughs> um, right, there's nothing worse than having a perfectly normal conversation with someone and then having uh, it turn, you know, you ask the person, so what do you do for a living? And they tell you, I'm a psychologist. And it's so terrible, right? It's shocking. And you think, what are they, have you been analyzing me this whole time? What uh, horrible things do you know about me? And I want you to know that although I am a psychologist, I'm not that kind of psychologist. <laughs> I don't um, have patients. I don't have clients. I don't, uh, I don't help people <laughs> at all. No, I do. I sometimes help people, but not psychologically. I'm not that kind of psychologist. I'm the kind of psychologist who studies happiness and the experience of meaning in life. And so I'm here today pretty excited to share with you some stories and some data, uh, hopefully a balance of each, to give you a sense of the answer to this question, what makes life meaningful? In psychology, uh, right now, the modern approaches to the experience of meaning in life place it up on a pedestal. These, this, uh, these slides show, whoa, there you go. Um, two kinds of happiness, hedonic well-being and what's called eudaimonic well-being. Hedonic well-being is just basically good moods, bad moods, and life satisfaction. And psychologists consider this to be sort of the happy, happy life. Uh, on the other hand, we have this more exalted experience of eudaimonic well-being which includes sort of self-actualization, the happiness that comes from living uh, in accord with one's values and, and engaging in virtuous action. And that is considered the meaningful life. I don't agree with this at all. <laughs> I, m my entire career has been spent trying to convince psychologists what you probably already know, which is to say these aren't two different kinds of happiness or two different kinds of well-being. That, in fact, the experience of meaning in life and the experience of happiness are deeply intertwined with each other, and one isn't a better form of happiness than the other. So I do study meaning in life. Um, so I was a, giving a talk at this uh, Sigma Xi, which is a, a hard science honor society, um, and they occasionally will invite a psychologist to come and give a talk because they know that our talks will be interesting. <laughs> um, and so an MU chemistry professor came up to me and said, Dr. King, I see from the title of your talk that you're going to be talking about meaning in life. How can you study meaning in life? Isn't it ineffable? By which he meant that it can be defined. And I said, oh, no, it's definitely effable. <laughs> Um, as you will see, we've effed it all kinds of ways as we, as psychologists, have come to study what it means to live a life of meaning. So this is what many people, how many people uh, have conceived of the relationship between happiness and meaning. 
So happiness is down at the bottom, and it's considered uh, common and easy to get and sort of a basic uh, experience, whereas meaning is on the top and is somehow rare and more uh, significant and important. That happiness, you know when you're happy and when you're not happy, and meaning is more ineffable, hard to define, difficult to experience that it's easy to come by happiness, but it's much harder to come by meaning. And then there, within psychology, there's even this idea that happiness, because a person can be made happy by anything, right? We could just feel happy because we just uh, won a uh, hundred bucks in a, in a lottery, um, or we can be happy because we helped somebody. Right? If, because happiness comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes, the source of happiness is sort of morally ambiguous, that happiness is somehow less good than the more pure experience of meaning. That meaning in life is somehow more rarefied, uh, that it should be put on this pedestal. And we, it's okay, sure, you can be happy, but if you want the real, the true good life, then you have to strive for meaning, right? Some kind of higher purpose. Uh, most of my research has been inspired by this quote from William James. And William James is one of the founders of the science of psychology. Every single psychologist that exists today can trace his or her pedigree back to either William James or Wilhelm Wundt, even though almost all psychologists want to be from the James side of the family tree. <laughs> William James uh, said this, all goods are disguised in the vulgarity of their concomitants in this workaday world, but woe to him who can only recognize them when he thinks them in their pure and abstract form. By which he meant all the good things that we see, right, the experience of meaning, living a virtuous life. All of the goods in human life are deeply embedded in everyday existence, in the mundane things that we do. If we reserve something like the experience of meaning and say, oh, that, that can only be attained by the, a person who's able to really think about it, come up with a way to live a meaningful life, or somebody who is, it has, has enough money or education or whatever to obtain some a pinnacle of human existence. Woe to us. And so my whole research program is really about trying to think about meaning in, it, in its concomitance, in its vulgar concomitance in our workaday world. From what makes life meaningful in our everyday lives not in terms of some special thing, some unusual experience, but in every single day. What makes life meaningful right? What makes life meaningful? What is making our lives meaningful at this very moment? So people say, you can't study meaning in life because you can't even define it. And I say, sure, we can define it. Here's one definition my students and I came up with, these my students at the University of Missouri and I came up with, that lives may be experienced as meaningful when they are felt to have significance beyond the trivial or momentary, to have purpose, or to have a coherence that transcends chaos. And this definition turns out to have been a really good one because it captures what is the current consensus about what it is people mean when they say their lives are meaningful. Generally speaking, when we define meaning in life, when psychologists have defined meaning in life, these are the ideas that come up. That one's life is significant. That means it matters to other people. Lives are experienced as meaningful when we feel like we matter to the social group, when we aren't forgotten. A sense of purpose, right? That our, our a daily lives are directed by goals, and we are, we, there's a reason for us to do the things we do. Sometimes people think of purpose as this really large scale, like, oh, my life of purpose. 
And it can be a very, but purpose can come. A feeling of purpose can come from a very small, um, much more constrained goal, like to have a day without pain or to have a day that's just a regular day. Um, coherence and making sense and having connections. These are all about living a life that makes sense, that life makes sense to the person living it, that has a sense of structure and order. Not that it's over-ordered that it becomes boring, but that the feeling of meaning is embedded in the simplest routines that we have in our lives. I'll give you some examples in a little bit. So the items here, these are the kinds of, this is without, these are, this is how we measure meaning in life. I've discussed more of this like kind of abstract definition. This is how we measure it. We have people look at items like these. My life has a clear sense of purpose, or I found a really significant meaning in my life. And we ask people to uh, read those items and then rate them on a scale from one to seven. So we just say, OK, we want to know. We're trying to study this mysterious concept of meaning in life. The way we're going to measure that is just by asking people, how meaningful is your life? And we ask people to rate it on a scale from one to seven. Now, um, this, uh, this particular attack has not, not, some people find this to be absolutely insane, right? How dare you pretend to measure meaning in life by asking people to rate it on a scale from one to seven. But here's what's super interesting. Even just this, these simple items, these simple ratings, relate to a lot of really important things. When people rate their lives as meaningful, I mean, oh my gosh, right? Ratings of meaning in life predict things like quality of life, life satisfaction, um, lower suicidal ideation, lower incidence of psychological disorders, um, uh, lower risk of heart attack and stroke, lower risk of cognitive decline with age, lower risk of uh, Alzheimer's, all kinds of in, uh, higher lifetime earnings, you name it, right? The person who feels their life is purposeful and meaningful is better off. Many of these studies use longitudinal designs and prospective designs, so we can say that a sense of meaning in life predicts these outcomes. So even if it is strange to measure something as abstract as a sense of meaning using just a simple questionnaire, these simple homely ratings seem to capture something that's important uh, for human life. Now, so if you want to think about meaning in life and uh, what it is that makes life meaningful, the way that I uh, think about meaning in life is probably different from how you might, right? You, we all know that people are searching for meaning, right? The verbs that we use to talk about what makes life meaningful are often about struggling to create meaning, trying to find meaning, uh, searching for this for a sense of meaning. If you go to any bookstore, right, the self-help aisle is filled with things trying to help us find a sense of purpose or meaning. What's interesting about that is that, okay, so we all feel this longing, this longing for meaning. But at the same time, many very famous psychologists have suggested that the feeling of meaningfulness, that, that a sense of purpose or meaning in life is actually adaptive. It's something that will help us survive. So Maslow said, the human needs a framework of values, a philosophy of life in about the same sense as he needs sunlight, calcium, and love. And Viktor Frankl in his um, very famous volume on man's search for meaning said, there is nothing in the world that would so effectively help one survive as the knowledge that there is meaning in life. If we take this idea seriously, right, that meaning in life, having a strong sense of meaning or purpose might actually help us survive, then <coughs> it's really a bit of a paradox. We have this idea that meaning in life is this ineffable mystery and it's rare and it's only experienced by very few people and it's very hard to find, and yet at the same time, this idea that it is adap adaptive, that it's essential for human life. It can't be both. Nothing we require to survive can be hard to find or be 
dead. So if meaning in life is essential for survival, then it has to be commonplace. And so that's what we have been, this is the idea that has driven my uh, research program, is this idea that it, because it has to be, it is, re it is necessary for survival, then it has to be commonplace. We ought to be able to find it at all the time. And so what we've tried to do is think about meaning with different verbs. Not struggling and searching, but happening. So if you think about that verb, to happen, to take place, to occur, to be experienced, to befall, can we think about the experience of meaning as happening? I think we do that all the time. And so I'm going to share just a couple of examples. So um, my students and I did, uh, I've done a lot of research where we've asked people from different groups to tell stories about their lives, to describe things about their lives. And we asked um, a sample of parents of children with Down syndrome to tell us the story of how they found out they would be parenting a child with Down syndrome. And these parents uh, wrote that story, and uh, we coded the stories for a variety of things. Um, so many of those parents, the story started with a prenatal test or some other, uh, you know, a few hours after the child was born. But for some of them, it was different. The story started with a dream or a feeling. That uh, or some coincidence, some weird uh, experience. So, for example, there was a mother who was just convinced that her child, the child she was carrying, would have Down syndrome. And uh, none of the prenatal tests that she'd had uh, were suspicious at all. But she was still sure. She just had this feeling that it was that her child would have Down syndrome. So she and her sister took her sister's children when she was about seven months pregnant, took her sister's children to a, an amusement park. And when they got there, the park was filled with children with Down syndrome. It happened to be this day that these children were all uh, on a field trip. And um, her sister, who knew about her concerns, took, she took me by the shoulders and looked in my eyes. You know this doesn't mean anything, she said. I looked at her and started to cry and said, you know it does. Now what's interesting, and we had like, you know, somebody, one of the moms wrote about how she and her husband, uh, they were at their baby shower and someone had given them the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. And the, father, the dad opened the book at random and started to read, and they recoiled in horror as they realized he was reading about Down syndrome. These are not moments where people are actively struggling to create meaning. They are moments when meaning just comes and hits you on the head with a hammer. And what's interesting about that experience of that kind of foreshadowing in those stories is that it was actually related to greater meaning, finding greater meaning in the experience of parenting a child with Down syndrome. But not all times, all of the times that meaning happens, does it have to be some big giant um, event with such gravity. And I wanted to share another example about how meaning happens. So this is, when I was an undergraduate at Kenyon College, I happened to take voice lessons. Uh, for four years. This was to prepare me for my eventual career as a Broadway star. <laughs> that didn't work out. There's still time. Anyway, so I was taking voice lessons, and this was when, um, okay, so I was a senior, my last, my last year in college, 1986, the, the beginning of the spring semester, and I was having my, I have to give you these details. It's very important. I would share these details so that you'll understand later why. Um, my lessons were at 11 a.m. on Fridays, and I would go, and then it would be over at 11.50. And I have, we were in this big auditorium where I would stand on the stage, and my teacher would be on the grand piano next to me. And 
he was running these uh, scales, right? And da, 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 da. and he was trying to help me hit this super high note. And I had never hit this note before. And you know, when you're, uh, if you've ever, if you have not ever done this, I strongly recommend it. It's super fun to take voice lessons. So you have to line up your um, instrument, right, and open down. Uh, and the last thing you do to make these really high notes is to uh, scowl, right, in this really horrible way. It's a look that would convey disgust. <laughs> but it doesn't. It means that you have to let the super high note out of your body, right? So I'm there, ah, and I hit it. I hit the note. And I stood on the stage, and I sustained this note. And I'm just standing there with this note coming out of me. And all of a sudden, the floor started to tremble beneath me. And the snow that was on the roof of this auditorium started falling off in great clumps as the whole building started to shake. And my teacher, who was a very religious slash spiritual person, got on his knees and pr started praying at the piano bench. And I'm like, ah, and I'm thinking, I will only use these powers for good, right? I caused an, I'm causing an earthquake, right? Ah, and the place is going shaking like crazy. I caused an earthquake. This is the story about how I caused an earthquake. So I, um, I've carried this story around, right, my entire life, that I caused this earthquake. And then I started thinking, did that happen? <laughs> if I caused that earthquake, wouldn't there be um, evidence of it somewhere? So I actually looked it up. And I did this with some, uh, some uh, apprehension, because I sure wouldn't want to find out that I made up this earthquake. Here it is, y'all. January 31st, 1986, an earthquake struck just before 11.47 a.m. Eastern Time. My, this is my earthquake, 4.96 4 on the Richter scale. Yes! I told you I went to Kenyon College. It said early speculation had the epicenter located from Columbus to southern Canada. Right, that's a line that includes Kenyon College. And then, of course, come to find out, no. Actually, the epicenter was located east of Cleveland. <laughs> um, but the quake produced very strong vi vibrations noticed by numerous people. And it, you know what? Then you might be thinking, well, what are the odds? What are the odds that I would hit that high note right before that earthquake hit? Well, they're not zero. It turns out they're not zero. <coughs> All over Ohio, people caused that earthquake. Some people did it by hitting high notes. Some people did it by having an argument and slamming a door. Some people did it by flipping on the light switch. Some people did it by turning on their hair dryer. That's the way we are, right? Human beings are like that. We aren't creating meaning all the time. We're just doing it. It's just the thing we do. We automatically ascribe meaning as we go about our lives. I caused that earthquake, and so did all those other people. We're doing it every day. Right? There's always uh, meaning happening. And then I want to tell one more story before we start talking a little bit about the data that we've collected to really understand the, this way of thinking about meaning. When I was in I started my career at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. I was there for quite a while before I came here to the University of Missouri. And um, my first couple years there, I decided to um, become a liter literacy volunteer. I was very much interested in helping uh, people learn to read. And so I became a literacy tutor. Um, and I had this student, and his name was Douglas. And Douglas was one of the most um, inspiring people I have ever met. He was uh, in his early 20s. He was African-American, he had a high school diploma, but he could not read. And he had uh, gone through the public school system in Dallas, Texas, 
uh, he was working at SMU in the food service. Um, and he, what he, what was, he was the cold cut sandwich person. And he wanted to become the fr a fry cook. But to become a fry cook, he had to take a test. To take that test, he had to learn how to read. And so he and I began to meet. We signed a contract that we, we would meet twice a week, every week, for two years, which is a long time and a big commitment, but we were both willing to make it. And so Douglas and I started to meet and work towards him <coughs> learning to read. Now, if someone has gone through 12 years of school and has not learned to read, they obviously had pretty, you know, probably some, some serious issues that should have been dealt with earlier. And he um, really struggled. And I had no idea how awful this was going to be. I had no idea how difficult it would be to help him. And in fact, for the first year or so, we made no progress, in my opinion. And I would say to him, Douglas, you know, this isn't, this isn't even working. <laughs> Why, are, why don't you just quit? <laughs> You're never going to learn how to read. That's the kind of psychologist I am. And he would say, Laura, how crazy uh, would I be? I need to learn how to read. I want a better life for my children. You're willing to help me? Uh, for sure, I'm just going to keep showing up. And I would say, okay, Douglas, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> but whatever. We saw it through. We kept meeting. It was so terrible. And it just, we were just in this awful grind. And that, to me, it seemed like we were making no progress whatsoever. But one day, towards the end of the two-year period, we uh, were reading a book together. We used to, we would read it, we'd do some activities, and then we would try to read from a book. And we were reading a book. It was a uh, biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. written for young adult readers. And I would read a paragraph, and then I'd hand him the book, and then he'd stumble through, try to read his paragraph, hand it back to me. I'd read my paragraph. So this one day, I started read. I read my paragraph. I hand it to him, and he starts reading. And it's like something has happened, some qualitative change, where he's reading. He's really reading. Like, if he hit a word and he didn't know it, he'd make sense of it and move on. And I couldn't believe it. I was so shocked. And so he hands me the book back. I read my paragraph, and I hand it back to him. And he reads it like you would read it or like I would read it. And I said, Douglas, what happened? Do you realize how well you're doing? What happened? And he said, he started laughing. He said, I know, Laura, I don't know what to tell you. It's so weird. Something hit me after our last lesson. I realized you walk around in the world. If you see a word, you don't just see the word, stop, and read it. You're just always reading. You don't stop and make sense of something. You just automatically read it. And I said, that's right. Douglas, that's exactly right. And he said, do you know something, Laura? I was driving the other day, and I saw something. I can't believe it. Do you know they put the names of streets on signs on the corners so you always know where you are? And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, do you know what, Laura? There are signs everywhere. And I said, that's right. Now, Douglas was talking about reading. But I think that we can think about what he said as it is relevant to the experience of meaning. We don't turn meaning on and turn meaning off. We're always experiencing meaning in our interactions in the world. We're all, it happens to us. Meaning happens automatically. We are always experiencing meaning. So if that's true, then we can start asking the question, what makes life meaningful? 
and my usual, the way I usually put this is, what makes life so meaningful? I'm an expert. I'm actually the, I was recently called the expert. <laughs> the, uh, the most, um, the greatest experimentalist who ever studied meaning in life in the history of humanity. <laughs> and so I'm allowed to tell you uh, that life isn't just meaningful. It is really meaningful. And that's not just life in general. That is your life. I'm the expert. I know your life is super meaningful. One of the first things that we have found that makes life meaningful is the experience of happiness. Now, everybody knows that you need to find meaning in life to be happy, right? People go and they buy books to help them make their life, lives more meaningful so that they can be happy. But what, um, what you know, psychologists know is that just because two things are related doesn't mean that meaning in life is causing happiness, it could go the other way around. What if being happy is part of what makes life meaningful? So my students and I have done studies, like a bajillion studies on this topic, and these are the kinds of results that we find. If we, we can put people in a good mood, right? We can give them candy, we can have them write about a positive experience, listen to happy music, we can give them an unexpected payment of $20, all kinds of things that we know will make people happy. If you do that, if you randomly assign people to a happiness mood induction, it will cause their lives to be more meaningful. That just being happy can make life meaningful. Another thing that makes life meaningful is living in a world that makes sense. Right? One of the components of the definition of meaning in life is that the world makes sense. So we decided to do a study to see if we presented people with things that make sense versus not, would that make life more meaningful? So we did the study. We showed people these pictures of trees. And what we did is we, took, we had four pictures for each of the four seasons, right? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. And we just did a very simple study. 16 pictures of trees, and we showed them to people. Half of the people were shown that we asked them, take a look at these pictures and tell us how they look on your uh, monitor. We just want to know how the, tree, how the pictures look. Half of the people saw these pictures of trees in random order. The other half saw them so that they just happened to go. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, winter, and so forth. After they were exposed to the pictures of trees, they filled out a questionnaire measuring their experience of meaning in life. So that blue bar is the people who saw the trees in seasonal order. Their lives were more meaningful after being exposed to stimulus, stimuli that made sense, to some pictures that were arranged in seasonal order versus random. We also did it again, just to make sure that that was true because it seemed so crazy, but sure enough, we got the same results. And then we did it and we asked people, we showed people trees in patterns without following the seasons and we still got the same results. So just being exposed to patterned patterns, being exposed to patterns and routines can make life feel more meaningful. So if you think about all the patterns and routines that we have in our lives, right, the rituals that we go through every day, well, that would suggest that there might be some really interesting and perhaps unexpected um, sources of meaning in life. So one thing we did uh, in a study, and I wanted to tell you about this because it involved undergraduates at the University of Missouri, and so that's kind of cool. These are uh, two undergraduate honor students helped us collect these data. But we were asking ourselves the question, well, can things that are associated with our routines make life more meaningful? So can coffee and bacon make mornings more meaningful. And here's what we did. We had these students take word find puzzles out and about to the community in Columbia, Missouri. And they just walked around and asked people, could you fill out this uh, questionnaire for me? I'll give you a piece of candy. And it had word, these word finds that had words related to breakfast, like bacon and bagel and coffee, or words related to dinner, like dessert, dinner, pizza, steak, and so forth. So people filled out these word find puzzles and then flipped them over. On the other side was a measure of meaning in life. 
And so what we were thinking is if, if routines may help us, if routines are a source of meaning in life, then when the word find puzzle matched the time of day that the person completed the word find, that it would make life more meaningful. So these girls went out on um, either in the morning or in the evening and had people fill out their word finds. And sure enough, what we found is that filling out a word find puzzle that was about the morning and morning words in the morning was associated with higher meaning in life than the opposite. And doing so in the evening was, uh, was associated with higher meaning in life for the evening words. Now, I'm a morning person, so this kind of bothered me because it is true that most people find the evening more meaningful than the mornings. But still, eating bacon and drinking coffee can help, or less I've been told. Now, if such common, simple experiences as just being in a pretty good mood, uh, the regularity of the seasons, uh, morning coffee can make life meaningful, then maybe meaning in life is more commonplace than we might think. Maybe life is actually sort of brimming with meaning. Is that possible? Well, we did recently did a, um, a review of the literature. We pulled out all of the studies we could find where they had measured meaning in life. And th this are, these are the results from a nationally representative surveys. So the health and retirement study, they asked people, did you feel your life has meaning? Did you feel your life has meaning 95% of the people said yes. Um, do you feel your life has an important purpose or meaning? 85%, 83% agreed or strongly agreed. This is the results of an, a worldwide survey done by Oishi and Diener for uh, Gallup. And what they did is they, this is looking at 22 different nations, asking people the question, uh, do you feel your life has a special purpose or meaning? 91% of people worldwide said yes. And that blue dot, the blue arrow is showing you the United States. Most people actually say that their lives have meaning. Now, of course, this is a yes or no question. Maybe people are overestimating because they have a little bit of meaning. So then we looked at all the possible times that researchers have measured uh, meaning in life and had people rate it on a scale from one to seven and we were able to find out well how what's the average amount of meaning in life that people experience it's about four and a half which is to say pretty meaningful most people's lives are pretty meaningful this is a, a frequency distribution of the average meaning in life in a whole bunch of different studies and what I would like you to notice is that on a scale from one to seven most people are up there around four and a half to five and five and a half, right? Where the modes are, are really out there. People's, people are saying their lives are meaningful. And I want to make it clear that those people in those higher levels of meaning in life, those aren't like a whole bunch of young college students. The lowest meaning in life on this, that very low little blip at the very end, that is a sample of college students, undergraduates. Right? Undergraduates seem to me to be the only people that sit around navel-gazing and deciding that life is not meaningful. <laughs> Those people that are out at the high ends, we're talking about people who've experienced heart attack, people who are uh, coping with breast cancer, people who have uh, serious psychological disorders. People say that their lives are meaningful in a host of different contexts. I sometimes, people sometimes give me a hard time. They're like, well, you just... You, you may, you're making it, you're cheapening meaning in life. You're saying everybody's life is meaningful. And you know what? I am saying everybody's life is meaningful. I would say that we are, do not have a problem in contemporary society that everyone thinks their life is too meaningful. Rather, the contemporary problems are about people not recognizing the meaning that imbues their lives and the lives of all of the people around them. People don't do suicide bombings because they think their lives are too meaningful. Kids don't shoot up schools because they think their lives are too meaningful. These kinds of things, right, depression, suicide, somebody kills themselves and everyone around them is shocked. And we all think, how did they not know how much they meant to us? That our problem, the modern problem is not that, that people think their lives are too meaningful. 
The modern problem is that people don't recognize how meaningful their lives are and the amount of meaning that imbues every human life. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about difficult times. I, I'm not a total Pollyanna. I don't think that life is super easy. I, uh, you know, everybody has difficulties in life, and I want to just talk a little bit about placing meaning in uh, and the good life, because the good life is often difficult. <clears throat> One of the most uh, interesting items that we give people when we study well-being is this item from the Satisfaction with Life Scale, and it is this. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And it's kind of an interesting item. And when we have given it to people, I think we just ask ourselves, like, what, what does it take to give that item a seven? To say, yes, seven, extremely. I agree with that item. And um, I think one way to give that item a seven is to be in denial, right? Is to just pretend that nothing bad has ever happened. But it's also possible to give that item a seven even in the context of being fully aware of life's difficulties, to being able to look at your life with warts and all and say, yes, I would, I would, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And so one of the things we did, uh, I told you that we, we studied these parents of children with Down syndrome. So one of the things we did is we looked at the people who gave that item a seven, who also showed signs on other measures that we had of being highly insightful and not being in denial. And um, from looking at their, looking at what they have to say, what the wisdom that they had to share, um, we came to recognize, right, that, that people know, right, these people, these incredible, uh, incredibly wise and insightful people seem to have um, a couple of lessons to offer us that life uh, has two guarantees, incredible sorrow and incredible joy, both beyond all imagining. And that the goal is not to be happy all the time or to never be surprised. The goal of life is to be there, oops, to be present for the joy and the sorrow and to be open to meaning when it comes. So one of the things we did is we took the highest happiness and the highest wisdom, and we looked at the stories those people had to tell. And I asked my students, we sat in a circle, and I said, okay, we're gonna read these stories, and when you hit somebody you think has a lesson to share, you think someone hit it, let me know. And that's when we stopped, we started doing this goosebump test, and one of the uh, moms told the story um, and that was the one that we said, okay, this is one of them. This is somebody we need to, to, to think about what this woman has to say about life. And basically, she told us this story. One of the questions we asked is, what's the happiest experience you've had with your child with Down syndrome? And this mother told this beautiful story about how um, her family, every Sunday, they would go to Mass. And uh, her son, at the time, was about 12 years old. He had Down syndrome. And he would get antsy, and he would start getting kind of uh, bored and fidgety, and she would tell him, if you want to, you can stretch your legs, and he would walk to the back of the church and go to the bathroom and then come back. So this one Sunday, he was getting kind of fidgety, and she said, okay, if you want to, you can go back and uh, stretch your legs. And so he walked back to the back of the church, and then he didn't come back. And he wasn't coming back, and he wasn't coming back, and she started getting really nervous. Like, where is he? What's happening? And she's looking back there. And finally, during the final song, she saw him loping down the aisle. So, fine. They get together. They're on their way out. And the mother was approached by a woman who had obviously been crying. And she said, and this woman told me the most beautiful story. She had been praying and crying in one of the side chapels of the church. And out of nowhere, 
this boy with Down syndrome came in and sat down next to her. And he put his hand on her shoulder and he said, I cry too sometimes. Like when my friend Amy died. But then I always say, put it in the Lord's hands. And he pointed to the cross. This was a, um, a lyric that he had learned in Sunday school. And the woman said to this mother, I honestly thought I had been visited by an angel. And the mother said, I looked in her eyes and I knew at that moment that she was right. She had been. So we quickly looked at this woman's questionnaires. Like, wow, what's she got, right? What is going on with her? She had the highest level of meaning in life, very high levels of life satisfaction, very high levels of wisdom. Was she in denial? No. One of the questions we asked is, have you ever been embarrassed by your child in public? All parents know that that is universally true. <laughs> Everyone should say yes. <laughs> We've all been embarrassed by our children in public. And she said yes. Have you ever wished that you, your child didn't have Down syndrome? Yes. She was not in denial, but she was open. She was open to meaning, to meaning just happening. I believe that um, everyone's life, life is imbued with meaning. I believe that it is not a mystery. There's no mystery involved. Meaning is part of our lives. It's part of the way we live. It's part of everything we do. I believe that existence can be difficult, <clears throat> that there are no guarantees that life will be easy, but we are lucky because we live in a world that has sunrises and sunsets. We have days of the week. We have morning coffee. We have a last glass of wine in the evening. We have a meal with friends. Life can be difficult, but there are signs everywhere. Thank you. Okay, got a, some interesting questions. What do you think about becoming happy by declaration, as in, I am happy? Is it possible? It would be easier. Uh, yes, I think it's possible. People talk about changing your attitude. Uh, we do know that happiness, in a lot of ways, is a state of mind. I am not saying that people are pressured into pretending to be happy when, in fact, they're not. But we have a great deal of control over how happy we are. Um, there are genetic, there's sort of genetics involved in happiness, and life circumstances certainly play a role in happiness. But happiness, a large amount, at least what, like a 30% of the happiness we experience is in our control. It's about activities that make us more happy. So it is possible, and I would suggest doing things like setting goals to enjoy happiness. Um, engaging in behaviors that are enjoyable. People miss, um, people underestimate how much just doing some things that are fun can be to improve a person's quality of life. Okay, why is there a negative correlation? Oh, you saw that between GDP and meaning. Uh-huh. Okay, so that picture of the um, happiness of nation or the, well, the meaning in life of nations showed a negative correlation between how wealthy the nations are and their level of meaning. And the two factors that seem to be most important are uh, religious faith and um, education. So religious faith um, tends to be strongly related to 
the experience of meaning in life. Social relationships are strongly related to the experience of meaning in life. People who are in um, the very most meaningful places, right, are like Sierra Leone that are very war-torn. And I think that those are places where people um, have no doubt that their lives are meaningful. But it's because of religion, primarily. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. Oh, good. What role does a religious belief and belief in God have in meaning in life? On a one to seven scale, very high. The, one of the most robust predictors of meaning in life is religiosity. Uh, people who have strong religious faith tend to have stronger meaning in life. And I wanted to um, mention, though, right, if someone is not at all religious, do you know what can make their lives just as meaningful? Happiness. If someone is lonely, but they have a, a mom momentary happiness, can actually lead to the same level of meaning in life as social connections and religiosity. Oh, one thing I want to mention to all, to all of you as well, I just, I was trying to find paper about Parkinson's and um, meaning in life, and I couldn't find one, but I found one about caregivers uh, and uh, AL, uh, people with ALS, so patients and caregivers and purpose in life. And what's interesting and, and rings very true to me, the, the um, quality, quality of life and purpose in life co-varied between the two, that is, people's lives are intertwined with the person they're caring for. Quality of life was much more bounced around much more by circumstances, whereas purpose in life showed resilience. That when you have a sense of purpose, it's not as likely to be bounced around by the vicissitudes of illness. So I thought that was cool. What suggestions? Yes. So my suggestions would be, uh, what suggestions for people with Parkinson's disease and their caregivers? I mean, I think one of the, the most important points I want to leave you with is this notion that meaning in life is not a some sort of rare or difficult to get experience, that your life is already meaningful. Recognizing that can be a huge step, right? Engaging in ritual, maintaining structure, knowing that these simple things that might not seem uh, like very much are actually part of uh, the meaningful life. Okay, is there a correlation between recognizing that they have meaning in their lives and being motivated to bring changes in progress. Yeah, so, yes. Is there, so on the one hand, we're talking about sort of goals, uh, ha making progress, feeling like you're going somewhere, and feeling that your life is meaningful. These two things are really strongly related, and they are, we don't know if they, which, which direction that goes. I know that engaging in goal pursuit leads to a stronger sense of meaning, but it may also be the case that if you feel your life has meaning, it will provide you with that foundation to uh, seek out goals. But I also want to make it clear that those goals can be small goals. So often I think people are like, well, but I don't want to do this dumb. It's, it's small. It can be a little thing. But it, it, there is a, a wonderful um, amount of literature from people in hospice, people with chronic and uh, terminal illness, showing that you can uh, experience a sense of purpose from the smallest of goals. I want to t spend this one hour um, sitting comfortably or reading, or I'm going to have a day where I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to constantly worry about this, um, the barriers to my happiness, right? Very small goals can still imbue a person's life with a sense of meaning. Are there any co-occurring diagnoses such as depression? Okay, well, I can say this. So there's a, there's a question about mental health issues, depression. <coughs> I'm not that kind of psychologist, as I mentioned. But I think oftentimes uh, purpose can exist and meaning can exist at the same time as someone is experiencing depression. One of the most interesting things about purpose and meaning in life is that even in people with uh, severe depression, if that person believes life has meaning, they are less likely to experience suicidal ideation and make suicide attempts, right? If life has purpose, if life has meaning, even in the context of severe psychological disorders, um, meaning and purpose can be 
uh, a resource. And then, can psychotherapy help? Absolutely. And again, I, and I think this is very important, right? I don't know that um, people should ever feel at all hesitant to seek out help. Unhappiness, I say, you know, I always talk, when I talk about my work, I always say, oh, happiness is easy and meaning is supposed to be hard. And I know many people would say, what are you talking about? Happiness is not easy. I wish I could be happy. Seek help because there is no reason to be miserable. We have so many effective treatments for depression, from psychotherapy to um, medication, that there, 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 sometimes there's good reason to be miserable. But we have at our disposal ways not to be. And so I would strongly recommend psychotherapy and, um, and treatment if someone is feeling uh, that life lacks joy. I think that's it. Thank you.